Well, yeah, yeah. Good morning. I just have a short message because we kind of know what Easter's about. And it might be what you would expect. But just think about it a minute. What is Easter really all about? Well, it's not a question and answer. I mean, I, it's not a quiz, believe me. Uh, it's about Jesus rose from the grave. Jesus rose, you knew that, didn't you? Jesus rose from the grave. And when he arose, he essentially set you and me free. He set, he set us free. God sent his son to set us free. The best thing about my life is that just before I turned 25, I accepted Christ as my Savior. Before... I was this miserable wretch of a person uh, who just lived for myself. But when Jesus came in, Jesus changed all of that. And even though my sin nature tries to suck me back into that sinful life, that sinful self-centered evil life uh, that the former person lived in, uh, Jesus gave me a new heart. And all I've got to do is listen to that heart. And all that I want, all that I am, all that I was created to be is part of what Jesus is trying to bring out. I can live a life now that will ultimately glorify God and bring honor to Jesus and affect others all because He arose from the grave. Uh, all because He set me free. But there were three things that Jesus gave to us that nobody else had and nobody else could see and nobody else could foretell before He arose from the grave. And that they're summarized in 1 Corinthians 13. I, I'm not preaching from 1 Corinthians 13, but he, he summarizes it all in three words, faith, hope, and love. The first thing we acquired was faith. It's a faith that looks forward. A faith that looks forward. We no longer have to focus on the past, even though Satan would try to keep us back there. Although Satan would try to make us stay there, even though Satan's going to bring it up and throw it in our face. We don't have to live back there. We have to live in the present. Uh, we look forward to a future hope that empowers us to live right now, in the here and now, for right now, anticipating what the future may bring. Titus 2.13 says, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Ultimately, that is our faith. We know it's going to happen. We don't know when, but that is our faith. And like the God of the Old Testament, we are called to live in the present. When Moses went to the burning bush, he said, they're going to ask me, what is your name? He said, what am I to tell them? And God replied, Yahweh. And it's translated in our Bibles, I am. I am that I am. And what it really means is I exist in the here and now. I'm in the present. Don't look for me in the past. If you're going to go back there, you're going to go by yourself. Don't look for me in the future. I haven't gotten there yet, even though I know what it's going to be. Look for me in the here and now. So stay in the here and now. I have a faith that looks forward, but I have a faith also that's sufficient. You know, before Jesus came, people did not really understand what their faith was all about. As a matter of fact, all of the Old Testament people, up until the time Jesus came, got it wrong. Because they did not accept Jesus, it had to start a whole new class of people called the church that really accepted him. It's a sad commentary, but you and I need to understand that the faith we live in now is not our faith. It's the faith of Jesus Christ. Galatians 2.20 says, uh, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless... I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, 
I live by the faith of the Son of God. Not my faith. I don't have enough. I live by Jesus' faith, which is totally sufficient for everything. Because it says He loved me and gave Himself for me. Third thing about faith is it endures. Because of that, the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, our faith is what lasts. Matter of fact, the word faith itself uh, means it endures. It remains firm. It is steadfast. That's what the word faith meant in the Old Testament. It's the new definition in the New Testament. But you understand, once it's defined in the Old Testament, the New Testament does not change that. It just adds to it. So in the Old Testament, faith meant something that lasted, something that endured, something that remained faithful or firm and steadfast. That's what God expects you and me to do. The second thing we acquired when Jesus rose from the grave was hope. Hope. Before that event, there was no evidence that anybody ever had a life after the grave. And what Jesus proved is we do. We have a hope that our lives go on and on and on because He lives. A hope that lasts. We don't just have a hope for tomorrow. We have a hope that sustains us in the here and now. Proverbs 29, 18 says, With no vision, the kinsmen perish. And he that keeps them, he that keeps the law is blessed. Now your Bible may not say it that way, but that's exactly what it says. It says, with no vision, the kinsmen, that's you and me, who belong to God, uh, we hang on. Matter of fact, the word actually means hang loose. So people that don't have the vision of what it's really all about, it says they hang loose and they go out of control. But it says the people who keep the law are blessed. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to keep our faith intact by following His plan. The world may go to hell in a handbasket, but you and I are on the straight and narrow, having entered in at the narrow gate uh, we faint, we fall, we fail. Sure, but our Savior never lets go of us. Amen. That's the important thing. We have a safety wire that's attached to heaven that's going to pull us back in one day. Even though we squander our lives away, that safety rope is not going to let go of us. Amen. We also have a hope that's unseen. When you live by faith, hope gives you a vision beyond what you can see. Uh, in the darkest hours of life, we have a hope that sustains us. I can remember going through dark, dark hours uh, when Victor was in the hospital, when Margaret was in the hospital, uh, and the things we had to, Satan tried to defeat us with. But our hope was that God was going to guide us through it all, and He did. He did. It helps us to see tomorrow when tomorrow's not obvious. It just helps us to see through it all. And we also have a hope that believes. Uh, what we believe is, uh, is what's important to us. And what we do believe as we wait is what's important. Uh, we believe the waiting on God is worth it. So we have a hope that believes. Because we believe what God said is true. Psalms 31, 24 says this. And I'm going to read it to you the way it should be interpreted because this is what's really important. And no version will give you this because it has two strange verbs in there in the Hebrew. Uh, uh, Proverb, I mean Psalm 31, 24. Psalm 31, 24. Your, your, your rendition says uh, probably something like, Be of good courage. Uh, he shall strengthen your heart as you hope in the Lord. But that's not what it really says. Because of the two Hebrew verbs, the hithpael and the peel, 
verbs. It should be translated differently. It should be translated this way. It, be strong and, and he shall strengthen your heart. All of the intensive, active waiting. And folks, we get into intensive, active waiting for things to come about that we know are coming. They're just not here yet. And it just drives us batty sometimes. He says, all of the intensive acting waiting belongs to God. Not you and me. We get caught up in it. I agree. But he says it belongs to God. All of our intensive active waiting really belongs to Yahweh. He just says, be strong and strengthen your heart. So where are we going to get that strength from? We're going to get it from the scripture. Because we believe that hope that is given to us in the word. The last thing we acquired was love when Jesus arose from the grave. Understand this. Jesus rising from the grave says we have a love that is unconditional. Nobody else is going to love us unconditionally. Nobody. Everybody else is going to find a fault. I mean, why do you think the divorce rate is what it is in this world? Because fault. Find fault. Unconditional love. Jesus accepts me just the way I am. Now, he does not accept my sin. And so when people say, you know, judge not that you be not judged, they're just trying to get away with their sin. When you point it out to them, they don't want to hear it. And I don't point it out that much, but I do point it out to some. But Jesus accepts me just the way I am. Not my sin, but me just the way I am. Because he knows what I'm made of. He knows what he put in me. He knows what he created. He knows what I should do, whether I do it or not. It's the real deal. Just without the dirt that I throw in there. And the filth that I throw in there from this life that I live. And sometimes, you know, it's hard for me to see what I do wrong. I know it's hard for you to see what you do wrong. But his love never fails. His love is unconditional. His love is also sufficient. If we just fall on him, he heals all the hurt. If we fall anywhere else, it doesn't work. If we fall on Jesus, it heals everything. So his love is unconditional, it's sufficient, and it's eternal. The Bible says God is love. And the Bible says God is forever. He always existed and he always will exist. So guess what? Because God is eternal and God is love, love is eternal. You choose to love somebody and it is forever. You can't get rid of it. And sometimes they use that to manipulate and destroy you. And that's the bad side. Faith and hope one day will be gone. The only thing that lasts forever is love. That was the conclusion of 1 Corinthians. Uh, it says, love never fails, but where there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall see. Where there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. But love lasts forever. Faith, when we get to heaven, will no longer be required because we'll be standing face to face with the object of our faith. Hope will no longer be required either because we will have gained everything that we always thought we should have. The only thing that will last is love. It will endure forever. And we'll live in an atmosphere of love because of it. John 15, 13 says, Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. So that's what Jesus really illustrated to us. He laid down his life for us. Showed us the greatest amount of love when he did it. You know, our ministry, and it's not just me, it's everybody that's a believer, is to lead people to the cross of Christ so that Jesus can change their life. He's the only one that can. You and I can lead them to the cross if we don't let our sin get in the way. And when we do, we just have to 
get up, brush ourselves off, and live in today, not in yesterday, not, let it, not beat ourselves up about it, and get on down the road and find somebody else to bring to the cross. You and I need to change our lives so that we're leading people to that cross during the time that we have left. You and I need to make the cross our number one goal for everybody else. We have to give up everything that keeps others from seeing Jesus so that everybody that we meet will see Jesus. Jesus gave us when He rose from the grave a faith, a hope, and a love to get us back to Calvary because that's what's important in our lives. He also said, if you do these things, if you accept this plan that I have for you, He said, then you'll find the peace that you need. When He died, he, after he, he left, He said, my peace I give to you. But it's conditional because we have to live the life of faith, hope, and love to get it. Jesus died and His love I see. Jesus rose giving faith to me. Jesus ascended my hope to be. Hallelujah. He's risen and I am free. We're going to close by singing 533. 533. He lives. He lives.